Uh, for those of you who've just joined us, I'm Nancy Netzer, and I welcome you. The exhibition in the Daly Family Gallery celebrates the restoration and recently discovered artistic significance of a monumental bronze masterpiece from Japan's Meiji period. For decades, a golden eagle, the icon of Boston College, perched on a granite column in front of the university's central building, Gasson Hall. As many of you know, the raptor stood watch over the campus while the sculpture's history remained unstudied and its condition deteriorated. Seemingly beyond repair, in 1993, the eagle was dismantled and replaced by a cast produced at Skylight Studios in Woburn, Massachusetts. The original languished in pieces at Skylight until 2015, when Russ Gant, a faculty member at Shoah Boston, a Japanese language and culture institute nearby, alerted Boston College to its possible importance. Heeding the information, the university's president, Father Leahy, in consultation with the museum's assistant director, Diana Larson, Victoria Weston, a professor of Japanese art at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, conservator Mimi Levesque, and Ben Birnbaum, then executive director of the Office of University Communications, deemed the original bronze worthy of restoration. Two years of painstaking treatment and reconstruction were undertaken by Rika Smith and her associates, Regina Gaudette and Karen Wolfe, and Robert Shore and George Stratakis at Skylight Studios. As the exceptional quality of the sculpture became increasingly evident during the cleaning, the McMullen decided to organize an exhibition which, with Larson and Weston serving as co-curators, would explore the Eagle's restoration, its storied past, and the context in which it was made in Japan, brought to the United States by collectors Lars and Isabel Anderson. Shortly thereafter, research pointed to the Eagle's probable attribution to the circle of master artist Suzuki Chokichi, whose works dominated Japan's entries in international expositions at the turn of the 20th century. Diana Larson and Victoria Weston tackled the complex task of conceiving the multiple strands of Eagle Mania's narrative and of identifying and securing nearly, nearly 100 related objects for loan. It is their dedication, knowledge, research, and educated eyes that have guided this endeavor. Thus, it is to them that the museum owes its deepest appreciation. The museum extends additional gratitude to Victoria for editing and contributing to the catalog, along with Rory Brown, Joe Earl, Regina Gaudette, Yuko Hota, Hei Yun Kim, Diana Larson, Tomoko Nagakura, Robert Schur, Rika Smith, George Stratakis, and Karen Wolf. The museum also recognizes Jerry Hayes, Charles Murphy, Midori Oka, and Betty Anderson Riley for their wise counsel and assistance in research and editing. Of course, the exhibition would not have been possible without the generosity of its lenders, and we extend special thanks to them. To bring both of the exhibitions that open today to fruition require the dedication of a strong team of professionals at Boston College, and I especially thank my colleagues at the McMullen, Diana Larson, John McCoy, Kate Shugart, and Rachel Chamberlain, the museum's student ambassadors, museum security, museum docents, led by Sharon Bazarian. There are many others who made important contributions, and I encourage you to read the credits labels on the wall of each exhibition. 
As always, such a complex project could not have been attempted were it not for the generosity of the administration of Boston College and the McMullen family. And major support for Eagle Mania was provided by the patrons of the McMullen Museum, chaired by Mike Daly and Peter and Leslie Champy. And now it's my privilege to introduce the co-curators of Eagle Mania. The first is one of the McMullen's assistant directors, Diana Larson. Many of you will know her work as co-curator with Vera Kreilkamp of two exhibitions, Rural Ireland and the Arts and Crafts Movement, Making It Irish, as well as for her innovative, striking, and elegant installation designs in our galleries over the past decade. In addition to being an accomplished exhibition designer, Diana is trained as a specialist in the decorative arts, working before coming to the McMullen at several museums, including the Museum of Fine Arts and the Harvard Art Museums. As you will hear today, it was her expertise in decorative arts that led her to take the leading role in arranging the conservation of the Boston College Eagle and co-curating Eagle Mania with our second speaker, Professor Victoria Weston of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. A distinguished scholar of Japanese art, Dr. Weston holds a PhD from the University of Michigan. She gathered the scholars to contribute to the catalog, which she edited, selected object, and constructed Eagle Mania's narrative. So please join me in congratulating and thanking both of our curators and welcoming them to the podium. I am thrilled to be here to celebrate the culmination of a three and a half year project. The return of our newly, sorry, got it? Everybody can hear me? <laughs> of our newly, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, newly restored bronze eagle, familiar as Boston College's iconic golden eagle that sits atop the granite column outside Gasson Hall at the end of Linden Lane, the subject of countless students' family photos, and in fact the most recognizable mascot for the university. As you may know, the current sculpture is in fact a replica of an, a circa 1890s bronze eagle crafted in Japan during the Meiji period a time characterized by the opening of Japan to the West and an amazing pro proliferation of the arts. I want to share the majesty of a real eagle with you by showing this photograph of a bald eagle with a salmon taken by my brother-in-law this past summer outside their home in Bowen Island, British Columbia. If you have never seen a live eagle, it is hard to express how magnificent they are to behold. It is easy to understand why this majestic bird was adopted as the American symbol and as Boston College's mascot. The striking BC Eagle with a nine foot wingspan was originally not gilded and had a greenish gray patina characteristic of its period. It was possibly crafted by one of the Meiji period's most gifted cast metal workers, Suzuki Chokichi, who specialized in depicting birds of prey which he studied from life. He apprenticed with his uncle at the age of 17 when he established his own workshop. Later, he became the director of the cast metalwork department of the, sorry, I just find my shelf here, um, of the manufacturing and trading company. His most famous sculpture, a study of 12 falcons, was displayed at the Columbian International Exhibition in Chicago in 1893. It is now in the National Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo. Chukichi exhibited extensively, extensively at the various international exhibitions and world's fairs, winning many coveted prizes. In 1896, he was nominated court artist and became a member of the Imperial Academy of Art. During the Meiji period, birds of prey were a popular subject for artists in different medias in different media, as you will see or have seen upstairs in the exhibition. Meiji bronzes, like the BC Eagle, were often commissioned for display at international world's fairs that showcased Japanese arts and crafts. These pieces were featured in elaborate displays where Westerners could view and buy them. 
these images of the Japanese gate and Fair Japan Pavilion at the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904 and Chicago's Japanese display of 1893 show the impressive array of objects on view and environments created to introduce view visitors to the wonders of Japan. In St. Louis, elaborate Japanese gardens evoke the feeling of the country for Westerners. Bronzes were also sold at art and antique dealers like the well-respected Samurai Shokai in Yokohama, which specialized in silks, porcelains, lacquerware, jade, bronzes, and more, primarily for the Western market. This shop offered financial support to traditional Japanese crafts workers like Chokichi, thus encouraging their skills and the production of the highest quality products for export. Samurai Shokai were purveyors to the imperial Japanese household and to many museums. Note the eagle on the top of the premises in this photo. Another British manufacturer and retailer in Yokohama was Arthur and Bond, and the Macmullen Museum is fortunate to have in its collection an elaborate sterling silver punch bowl made by this firm in, and that has recently been restored, and it is displayed upstairs in our exhibition. The Boston College Eagle has an interesting provenance, having been owned by the Lars Andersons of Washington, D.C. and Brookline, Massachusetts. Diplomat and collector Lars Anderson traveled around the world following his graduation from Harvard College and first visited Japan in 1888. In 1897, he married Isabel, we Isabel Weld Perkins, whose estate, Weld, in Brookline, near Jamaica Pond, became their country home for many years, their primary residence being in Washington, D.C., now the Society of the Cincinnati. That year, the couple honeymooned in Japan, among other stops in the Far East. In the Anderson archives, we discovered the original invoice documenting that our eagle was bought during that very trip, along with 31 cases of Japanese objects that formed the nucleus of their extensive collection. Uh, a Boston College Globe writer described the couple thus. These Andersons, they were idle rich, born to money and accustomed to privilege, but they were interesting people and left us something. <laughs> After Isabel's death in 1948, the estate was donated to the town of Brookline and is now called Lars Anderson Park. The main house was subsequently torn down, leaving the carriage house which became the Lars Anderson Auto Museum and can be still visited today. The Society of the Cincinnati in Washington today houses not only the archive, but also a museum of the Andersons' possession. They have generously lent us many fine objects from the collection, which you'll see upstairs. Some early photos show the estate and its elaborate Italianate gardens, of which there is little left. A skating rink now fills the space, uh, much of the space, should we say. Um, and the Andersons then hired a Japanese gardener to create a Japanese garden at Weld in 1904. And Isabel's 1909 photograph shows our eagle in a prominent spot there. Lars Anderson became ambassador to Japan in 1912-13, and the time spent there had a profound effect on the, on the couple. Isabel subsequently wrote The Spell of Japan, one of her many publications featuring travel. In the 1930s, the eagle was relocated to a new Japanese garden inspired by their time abroad. The Andersons were also collectors of bonsai trees, which they purchased in Yokohama. Some of the surviving plants from that collection are now housed at the Arnold Arboretum in Jamaica Plain. The Andersons made a meaningful connection with Boston College in 1933. In one of his colorful diaries from February of that year, Lars Anderson wrote descriptively about Boston College's Jesuit fathers when documenting a rehearsal of Boston College students who were performing one of his wife's plays. I quote, 
Um, as the new year advanced, Isabel became busier and busier with the production of her play, Dick Whittington, with music by Mrs. Galesian, which, which had been taken on by Boston College. Plans had become very ambitious. The Boston Opera House had been engaged, and the cast numbered 120 for the members of girls' and men's clubs all wanted to take part. The Jesuits' fathers, especially Father Lynch, Fathers Lynch and Gallagher, the head of Boston College, proved splendid men, remarkable men, big and manly and handsome in their <laughs> priestly way. <laughs> they carried on and dominated in so quiet and wonderful a manner that we hardly realized they were there, but one or the other was always there. We learned to admire and respect these Jesuit fathers, extraordinary men who play their part under discipline and with discipline. For the young men and girls taking part proved a revelation in their behavior under the direction of these priests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Isabel herself wrote a note of personal thanks to Father Lynch. Dear Father Lynch, I am writing to express, you, to express to you my sincere thanks for having taken on my play. Your courtesy to me throughout the rehearsals has been much appreciated. And I never saw nicer girls and boys and so interested to do their parts well. Very sincerely yours, Isabel Anderson. So this, this slide I'm showing now shows the front and back program from the Junior Philomathia Club for Dick Whittington performed at the Boston Opera House. Lars Anderson predeceased his wife and when she died in 1948, many of the couple's Brookline possessions were distributed amongst their employees. One of them, Gus Anderson, no relation, um, who had been born on the estate and was Isabel's private secretary for over 40 years, received the eagle. He displayed the sculpture in his own garden on the estate. Love this photo. This is Gus with his grandchild. <laughs> um, and uh, he, uh, sorry, let me go. Until his concerns for its safety from the weather, there were a couple of hurricanes in that year. Um, uh, caused him to donate it to Boston College in 1954. Gus Anderson knew of the Andersons' fondness for the Boston College and its students as a result of the 1933 production. He himself was a devout Catholic and also a football fan, so it was logical that he would choose BC as the appropriate recipient of the Eagle. Besides, Fathers Herlihy and Sullivan, moderator of BC's Alumni Association, visited the estate and upon be beholding the magnificent eagle, expressed to Gus their enthusiasm to have it for the college. According to his living relations, Gus was given one ticket to a Holy Cross versus BC football <laughs> game as a thank you for his gift. <laughs> In reaction to proposals of various animals for BC's mascot, Reverend Edward McLaughlin wrote in the 1920s, it is important that we adopt a mascot to preside at our powwows and triumphant feats, and why not the eagle, symbolic of ma majesty, power, and freedom, its natural habitat in, high, in the high places. Surely the heights is made in order for such a selection. Proud would the BC man feel to see the BC eagle matching the trophy of victory from snatching the trophy of victory from old opponents, their tattered banner clutched in his talons as he flies aloft. The Anderson Eagle would take the, its esteemed place at Boston College. I was recently um, contacted by Charles Murphy, class of 1955, who, with another student, was instructed by Father Sullivan to pick up the Bronze Eagle in a truck from Weld and bring it back to campus. He and his fellow housemates at Alumni Hall were char charged with guarding the eagle there. He tells the story of sleeping after a few too many beers when Boston University's rival football team came in the night and painted the eagle red. He had to remove the paint the very next day. The Bronze Eagle was displayed there, in the outside Alumni Hall, on a poured concrete platform until late in 1955. Um, I'll just show another, oh yes, there we are. Um, when Boston College acquired the column and base of the Dewey Monument from the, from the front of South Station in 1955. 
The pink granite column was originally designed to commemorate the accomplishments of Admiral George Dewey during the Spanish-American War and installed in front of South Station, itself topped with the carved eagle, by the way, in 1899. During the Central Artery Project, Dewey Square was eliminated and the column was donated to Boston College. It was decided to move the eagle from Alumni Hall to the high place on top of the column. So that's, a, that's actually a picture of, of it outside Alumni Hall. Um, let's see here. And um, we, the, the column, it was adapted for the purpose of going onto the column and for it to be placed in front of Gasson Hall. The rock-like tapering base supporting the eagle decorated with leaves and tendrils can be seen in the photo of it out, outside Alumni Hall. Sorry, there we are. In order to fit onto the round column, though, the wider section of the eagle's decorative base was cut off, leaving only the narrower half to support the sculpture. We still hope that that uh, missing part of the base might be somewhere around campus. We've even thought of going around with a metal detector to see if it might, <laughs> might turn up somewhere, you know. Um, it might even have some signature of the artist on it, which would be really exciting. Um, at that time, the decision was also made to gild the bird, hiding the original Meiji gray-green bronze patina. There are two comparable monumental eagles um, that exist that we know of, one in Kansas City. Um, this eagle first stood in the courtyard of the Japanese embassy and is now located on Ward Parkway and 67th Street. It is said to have been purchased at the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904 and later acquired by the Nichols family of city planners who donated, to, donated it to Kansas in 1935. Another bronze Meiji period eagle monumental on a rocky base stands in a lake in Queen Mary's Gardens in Regent's Park in London. Its provenance still remains elusive. I have been to see both of these eagles and created in situ films of them, which are included in our exhibition upstairs. This was a way of bringing these remote and related eagles, similar in scale to ours, uh, to, to the college. Um, Gus Anderson's concerns about Boston weather proved providential. In 1993, after sustaining weather-related damage, the BC Eagle was removed and taken to Skylight Studios in Woburn, Massachusetts, where it was repaired and cast. The golden eagle currently on the column outside Gasson is the result. And you can see in this slide that it too has suffered damage from the elements. In 2005, the story of the BC Eagle was brought to our attention by a teacher at Shoah Boston, which Nancy mentioned. And with my former colleague from the MFA, Mimi Levesque, an experienced objects conservator, I went to visit the original at Skylight Studios, which was formerly the Caproni Brothers uh, known for casting fam famous sculptures. A very cool place, actually. Um, with the owner, Bob Schur, we assessed the eagle's condition. Oh, just that's showing the casting uh, that took place in 1993, the creation of the molds. And then uh, with the owner, Bob Schur, who's featured here, um, we assessed the condition of the eagle, finding it in a rather sorry state, covered in dust, and in several pieces, as seen in these slides, I'm just going to go quickly with a few to give you an idea of this, the state of this bird. The wings and the base. You can see these nasty old fills that were there as well. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, the next step was to have it cleaned off, crated, and moved to Boston College's Newton Warehouse. So that's the warehouse, taking the crates. And once safely, safely there, I con consulted with two area Japanese experts to verify the fine quality of the craftsmanship that we had identified was correct, one of whom is sitting right here, my co-curator. <laughs> um, both experts agreed that the eagle was a superb work of art and worthy of restoration. So the next task was to locate conservators having experience with Meiji period cast bronzes. At first, we thought that the sculpture might have to travel to Japan for this. But fortunately, two Bos qualified Boston area people provided proposals. As a result of her excellent references from many museums and her professional condition assessment of the eagle and thorough treatment proposal, we decided on Rika Smith McNally in Natick. 
We transported the eagle to Natick in t July 2017 for treatment, where Rika's team removed the sur surface gilding. Oh, that's just backing in, unloading, unloading the eagle. And that's her studio there. And she and her team removed the original gilding to reveal the original patina beneath. So there's a few, that's her matching the possible patinas because it's, it's quite a, an involved task to choose the colors. And um, that shows the pre-restoration. Uh, then here, they've removed the gilding of partially of the head. And you can start to see some very subtle colors underneath. Um, let's see here, and that was the result, the first result. Um, so, <clears throat> Rika's team removed the surface gilding to reve reveal the original patina beneath. Meiji bronzes had multicolored patinated surfaces, incorporating the techniques of Shibuichi, a gray green patinated alloy of copper with various quantities of silver, and Shikudo, blue black patinated alloy of copper with a small quantity of gold as well as a variety of other colors created from substances derived from minerals and plants. Much of the surface detail of our eagle was re removed, uh, was revealed when the gilding was removed. Uh, the eagle was moved again back to Skylight Studios in Woolburn. Just showing some more pictures here. Um, Um, and, and where Bob Schur and his team of craftspeople have created an interior armature to support the bird, leaving its wings removable for easy assembly. Some photos from Skylight Sh Studios show the various components of the eagle, its base, its feet, its tail, and body, and how the different elements were reunited. So these are just a couple of those. The wings are separate and attached using pins, so this slide shows them actually inserting one of the wings into its socket in the body. Then Rika and her, oh, we brought a pedestal out as well. Put the pedestal. And Rika and her assistants came back out to Skylight Studios to patinate the surface and bring the eagle back to its original Meiji period appearance. So here are some slides of Rika and her team showing that process, which took three days, three full days. Following that, the team at Skylight stabilized the eagle on the pedestal, and that would be our result. You might be interested to know that we have chosen a place for the eagle to go on permanent display following our exhibition on the second floor of the McMullen Museum's atrium, its wings silhouetted against the sky because it can never be seen outside again. I propose creating a contextual exhibition at the McMullen Museum to showcase the newly restored eagle, which was enthusiastically endorsed by the President's Office and the McMullen. Um, I asked Victoria Weston, Associate professor, professor of Art History at UMass Boston, one of the scholars initially consulted to look at the eagle in storage, uh, to collaborate with me on an exhibition featuring our restored BC eagle. A Meiji period expert, Victoria was very excited about the project. I can now say what a great privilege it has been to co-curate Eagle Mania, collecting Japanese art in Gilded Age America with Victor Victoria. The benefits of her knowledge and scholarship of the Meiji period have proved invaluable. During the past two years, we have had many fruitful research trips to Washington, New York, and around New England to select close to 100 objects from public and private collections to illustrate the various themes we have developed to complement our eagle story. I am now delighted to introduce Victoria to tell you about the exhibition's narrative and some of the treasures that you will see upstairs. I'm the right distance from this. <laughs> so I can be very brief. Diana's given you quite a lot of the background. The, um, the slide that you see here is a model of the exhibition. The idea with the exhibition was we essentially had a kind of blank slate with the eagle. We had no background on it. We had no signature. We had no records. We had no nothing. And um, basically, we had to work out how to approach it. 
it was, I will say, a huge relief when the patina when the gold and all the other accretions were taken off to find that it really was Japanese. I have thought many times what would have happened if it were American or Chinese or something. It would be a very different exhibition. But the exhibition design is essentially um, a series of questions, an art historian trying to figure out what this thing is and how it fits into its history, its context. The, where is it? Okay, so the exhibition design, originally I saw, this is the BC Eagle down here, and the original idea was that, I, I really was attached to the idea that he, whoop, what'd you do that for? Sorry, that he would be in the middle. And apparently I can't put the cursor in the middle. That he would be in the middle and the galleries would be like radiating spokes around the various ideas, you know, what do you ask of a work of art? So the first gallery, I'm not touching this thing, so it's to the far left there. The first gallery is a kind of introduction. Obviously we couldn't put him in the middle, he's too big. He had to go in the back gallery where the height of the gallery accommodated both his height and the lift that was needed to put him there. So the first galleries are an introduction, basically the imagery of eagles and hawks in the two periods they appear in most, the Edo and Meiji periods. The next two galleries are Edo period galleries in which we look at particular contexts of social use of the imagery and the kinds of objects that result from that. The following pair is the 19th century, one side evoking world's fairs, because for a very long time I expected this eagle to have some kind of background in a world's fair. The accompanying gallery is around the Andersons, who were the original purchasers. And then finally, the last gallery is the eagle himself and some comparisons and contextualizing in his period. So I'm gonna walk you just very quickly through the galleries. But, right, but before I do that, you need a mini history lesson. There are, two rep there are two historical periods that are relevant to this gallery. The first is the Edo period, and rounding off the numbers, I'm, I, I do know the actual dates, <laughs> rounding off the numbers, Edo is roughly 1600 to 1850. And this is a period of samurai and warrior leadership. Much of the imagery emerges particularly around hawks with samurai. Commodore Perry arrived in Japan in the mid-19th century, and a great deal of change was precipitated by that. The Japanese had had a limited uh, diplomatic engagement with the outside world, but in particular, um, limiting their engagement with Western countries, which were basically more trouble than they were worth. So they just closed, and um, many countries in the mid-19th century were interested in making Japan open up. Essentially, the Americans got there first. So this is Commodore Perry's squadron landing uh, at, just outside of the capital. The fall of the government was kind of inevitable because samurai are warriors, they're supposed to protect the country from foreigners, and they weren't able to do that. And what ensued was a kind of restoration of imperial rule, at least in the sort of figurehead, you know, the political use sense. So an emperor reigned as political leader for the first time in hundreds and hundreds of years. This is Emperor Meiji, and he, his reign name, Meiji, is what gives the name to the second period that you see in this gallery, in the exhibition, sorry. So the galleries, the front galleries, give you a variety of media for just what do hawks and eagles look like in Japanese art. This is a very fine um, folding screen which appears at the end of the eagle side of the gallery. Eagles were very rarely portrayed in Japanese art in the Edo period or earlier. So this is an unusual depiction and he's a real eagle. Um, it's a very fine ink painting and it has a dynamic style that was meant to appeal in particular to warrior elites. This is all ink work, the forms are very strong, 
and the eagle kind of presides over this somewhat um, rough terrain, kind of like maybe a, you know a, a daimyo lord would over his own territory. The imagery, that's a hawk, okay. The other side shows us hawks, and hawks were better grounded in Edo art. Samurai were avid collectors of hunt, trained hunting hawks, and so we see them represented in a variety of ways. This is a Meiji representation of a hawk, and it, is, it shows a kind of continuation of interest. Even when the Samurai government fell, hawks continued to be interesting because there was a rise in naturalistic depiction. And so uh, hawks kind of were part of this larger natural setting for exploring the creatures of the world. This is a very large piece, and that's because in the Meiji period, foreigners became important collectors of Japanese art. So this is a large ensemble, a very naturalistic looking hawk on a real wooden stump. So not a representation of a perch, but the attempt to really try to make it look like nature. I think this is doing every other slide. So anyway, the slides aren't exactly going the way I'm expecting. Um, at the, when we get into the next two galleries, these are split according to social class. So this is a very famous woodblock print, and it is part of the galleries that is devoted to the imagery of commoners. In uh, Japanese culture, the hawk was associated with winter because the largest hawking expeditions tended to go on in that season. And if we know this, we can look at the picture now. This, it's famous because it's such an unusual vantage point for a picture in the 19th century. We're kind of up way high with the hawk, kind of cruising the skies and looking down. But now that we know what season he is associated with, you can look down and see that all that white is meaningful, that that is snow. And the stars that we're seeing are through the crisp, clean winter air. Hawks were desirable and interesting to commoners because they were part of decorating for the New Year's. And New Year's was Japan's most important holiday. So woodblock prints, because they were generated in so many multiples, could be bought relatively cheaply. And this would be a way to you know, kind of decorate for the holiday. OK, what's going on? I just showed him. This is the hawk again. Oh, I didn't. OK. I know what's going. I know what's going on. Okay, all right. So this is the hawk. Let me go back a minute. Yeah, and it has the label "Silver Hawk," which is why I was looking down at that because that's what my glasses line up with. I know. Okay, so I have graduated lenses. I'm not actually seeing the picture. <laughs> I'm seeing the bottom part. Okay. So let me back up a little bit. This is an eagle. But the, what I was talking about with naturalism still holds. With eagles, though, the Edo period had very little use for them. They were really rare in Japan. They did exist there, but they were high up in the mountains and very rarely encountered. So it's with the Meiji period that eagles take off as a subject because now there's an international audience for them. So a Japanese might be interested in a depiction of an eagle but so might a German or so might an American because they were being used as national symbols throughout the Western world. The size of these ensembles, this one and this one, which is a similar kind of arrangement, uh, you know, a depiction of a, of a bird, a raptor, on a natural wood stump, these are really large pieces. And the size of them also suggests they were aimed at Western collectors. In this case, the desire for naturalism is taken down to like the level of the metal, because this is, this is really him, right? Uh, this is a silver eagle, uh, hawk, and the idea with silver was to replicate white plumage in the feathers. Because white was, in any of the creatures of the world, white was understood to be auspicious. So using the silver was one way to enhance the value of the object using a semi-precious metal 
but also to make it kind of auspicious in its coloration. The other Edo period gallery centers on samurai imagery. So this is a very fine album of hawks and calligraphy. It's an album essentially aimed at a young samurai, both teaching the art of hawking, but also inculcating uh, various sort of Confucian ideas of responsibility and duty. So these images were made, the pictures were made by a very high level Japanese painter who regularly was catering to um, samurai patrons. And the album is you know, a deluxe kind of production. The one on the left is what we have on display. And this is an image of a hawk basically destroying its prey with the little feathers flying all around. It's the only image in the album that has no background setting, kind of setting this one off as a unique moment in the album. The other hawks are like the one on the right with a natural setting, they're either standing on a branch or a rock. And the album makes is careful to like mix up the seasons. This is one where we're not asked to think of the hawk as winter, so much as to think of this as a sport, as a culture, as something with values that go across the year. There's another, in this section, there's a pair of screens that are a real sort of um, high production here with a great deal of gold, a lot of description of various kinds of creatures, and the focus is really birds. So to, to my mind, this is the, like a, a tour of a samurai garden. The other screen that I'm not showing has a variety of songbirds, and it has a family of chickens wandering around with these little baubles of baby chicks sort of falling over. This side, though, is, showing, is focusing on the most prized birds in a samurai estate, and that is the, the um, hunting hawks. Hawks were collected when they were young or when they were newborns. So this is a great big habitat. And, like, we're inside it, which is pretty, pretty cool. The um, habitat requires these perches. This is a, a kind of fake tree, and they had to construct a nest for the, the new hatchlings. And we see you know, birds here and there, and over here is a water bowl. Food would have been restricted as part of the training of the hawks. Hawks are, are sensible hunters, and they don't take on prey that they, can't, they aren't sure they can take down. But if you get the hawk as a baby, you can train it to go after things it would not normally. So hawks, when taken very young, would do things like go after a crane and a crane could kill a hawk because of its bill. So the, it's only the little guys that you could train to do this kind of hunting. This is a depiction of hawks tethered. So this was a, a really common samurai theme because hawks were collected like treasure. So they had these rather elaborate tethers that included the curtain, Sometimes a hawk would get like batting its, its wings and it would destabilize itself. And the, the curtain there was to help it claw its way back up to the wooden perch. This screen has like the, the subject matter and a lot of the, pro, the approach of something meant for samurai, but in style it's not because the samurai were really keen on their birds. But this collection of birds, there are two screens here too, is restricted to a palette of black and white. This is somebody who's more interested in pattern. And kind of, if you start really looking at these screens, it's like there's this conversation going on between the birds. The other screen looks much more like an argument between two factions of birds. And this artist too, he does, there, there's a lot of like form and pattern, but in one place, He's very, very detailed, very, very interested. And it's exactly the place that no samurai would have been. It's these eeny weeny little spots of perch. Where's the cursor? There's these little bits right in here that are these elaborate um, floral designs. And much more like being interested in textiles than being interested in hunting. Uh, commoners in the Edo period this is out of order. <laughs> Commoners in the Edo period 
uh, liked hawk imagery for New Year's. And there was, there developed a kind of vocabulary of specific images for the New Year. Now on the left is another print, and we see a young man, and he has a hawk, and we see half of Mount Fuji. There was this idea of the three lucky dreams of New Year's, and the three things were hawk, Mount Fuji, and eggplant. Mount, <laughs> uh, the hawk, thanks to a homonymic relationship, ended up, so hawk, the word for hawk is taka, and that's also a word for tall or a lot. So it became a symbol of plenty. Mount Fuji is a homonym for the idea of resplendent. And Mount Fuji is this kind of guardian of the capital city. Eggplant are just full of seeds and they're round, you know. So they were a symbol of fecundity. Undoubtedly with the print, the rest of Mount Fuji, a beautiful young woman holding an eggplant, would have been on the other side. We have the eggplant in the exhibition with this little netsuke. This, the object you're seeing is just, it's real small. And it's the perkiest little hawk, right? And he's, like, mm, and he's standing on top of the eggplant. This would be part of personal adornment and you would, you know, this is, this is your Christmas sweater, right? This is what you haul out for the holiday and then you put it away. The world changed in the 19th century and this is a, uh, Remarkable jar. This is Japanese made. We have the correct orientation in the galleries. The main portrait image is of Japan's Emperor Meiji. But then there are these portraits going all the way around of uh, Western world leaders and even on top. So on one side, so Emperor Meiji is over to, I think he's over, uh, anyway, he's on one of the sides. Emperor mm -hmm. Meiji's on one side and he's being shown with his Western peers. So that's Ulysses S. Grant, and Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, Tsar Alexander's on the lid. On the other side is the notion that Meiji is like the father of modern Japan. And on the other side, you get George Washington, uh, Napoleon, and a couple other people. But this really is a marvelous way of presenting the idea that Japan is now engaging in the wider world. With the change though, a number of metal artists got displaced. They were catering to samurai, but there were no more samurai because in modern Japan that whole feudal system was dismantled. And Buddhist temples, which were the other great consumers of metal goods, had lost their, pa their central patronage from the government. So metal artists in particular had to think up something else. But metal art in Japan was at a very high level. The metal alloys that Diana referred to, for instance, were not known in the West. And metal artists were used to looking at alloys and patination and so forth to create a kind of palette of color for metal. So this warm brown color is, is one of these proprietary recipes that Western collectors valued hugely. The other thing that Western collectors loved was the use of natural imagery. Here you have this whole composition of fish and the waves are pulled up to become handles. This is the kind of object that would have been sold or exhibited and sold at a World's Fair. This is in the gallery where we try to evoke a World's Fair kind of um, feeling. If you were rich enough, you could actually go to Japan and Yokohama was the port of entry for most visitors. Yokohama was lined with shops, kind of like the world's biggest airport you know, gift shop, and you could pick up whatever it was you hadn't purchased while you were touring. This is a lacquered small kind of cabinet, and it is in a particular style that developed in Yokohama for foreigners. So it's a traditional lacquering, but then it has a pretty high, if this doesn't make sense, high, low relief. It has these inlays that stick up quite a bit from the surface, and it's this whole a range of stuff. You know, it's mother of pearl, there's gold, there's semi-precious stones. This is, in a sense, really gilding the lily. This is aimed at foreigners because the, a Japanese 
potential consumer would look that, at this and kind of scratch their head because hawks belong in winter. But this is tethered hawks, so you're referring back to the romantic world of samurai and cherry blossoms. And it's the, you know, it's the Western world that thinks cherry blossoms belong in Japan always instead of just spring. And hawks are, you know, th there's no snow. Lars and Isabel Anderson were among those who could afford to travel to Japan. Uh, so this is a bust portrait of Lars, who had been an ambassador to Japan. He was a diplomat by career. On the right is a portrait by an important American portrait artist, Cecilia Bow. And this is, one, this is pretty much the first portrait Isabel had done of herself. And it shows her essentially with their treasures, right? So Louis XIV furniture, and then a small gold Japanese screen, and just at her hand, a crystal ball with an ivory stand. Japan was like the place to get crystal balls. And whether it was a crystal ball or it was you know, clean, smooth lacquer, Westerners were rubbing these things trying to see the future. I mean, there were people rubbing lacquer trying to see the future. They weren't necessarily trying to see the future, but it was a really high prestige object. And we have the portrait and the crystal ball upstairs. The crystal ball came from their wedding trip to Japan. On the left is the page of the packing inventory. We, there, we were doing um, file research at the Society of the Cincinnati, and I, I went for the file marked miscellaneous, and I found it there. And it shows, this page shows clearly that the eagle was purchased on the, um, the honeymoon, that it needed three crates to be packed. But the, the invoice shows the crystal ball and lacquer. I'm quite sure that the lacquer that we have in the show, the, they collected lacquer several times, but I'm quite sure that this is one from the honeymoon. So the eagle got planted, as it were, in the garden at their Brookline estate, and he was put in the pond with a very tall plinth. And he's got various other sorts of Japanese effects around him. The, the Andersons had one of the earliest Japanese gardens in the United States. And it was partly because they loved the Japanese landscape and they loved Japanese gardening. So this is him. He's missing, you know, it is, uh, it, it tends to continue to throw me off that he should, such a big bird should be standing on such a small rock. I mean, the loss of the rest of the base is a killer. But he's still you know, cleaned up. He looks great, you know, like a lot of people. Clean them up, they look good. <laughs> it's plausible to think of him as the work of Suzuki Chokichi, which is an idea we explore in the last gallery. Chokichi did specialize in uh, various kinds of bronzes, but bronze raptors. So this is one of the hawks from the set of hawks Diana showed that was displayed in Chicago. You can see the care with the color and so forth with the metals. Um, Suzuki Chokichi rarely signed his big pieces. So even if we do find the bottom of the base, we may not find a, a signature even then. So we really kind of have to think about it in terms of comparison with other work. So we are very fortunate to have this marvelous uh, bronze, no, excuse me, iron eagle from the Metropolitan Museum in New York here. This is one of these great presentation pieces again. But we're sort of like, we have to make comparisons. We have to think about style. We have to think about how various elements of the, of the figure were executed, what kinds of things are consistent. So when you go through the galleries, you know, I invite you to sort of try and do that yourself. Look at the two and say, you know, are they cousins? Are they, you know, do they, do they share kinship or not? But I, I do think it's plausible that this is by Suzuki Chokichi. So that's the exhibition, and I hope you enjoy it.